New York didn't have enough ventilators, so you built one in a month. And as I understand it, it's already been approved by the FDA. Give us the short story. How did you do this? Well, uh, we actually were called early on. I was, as well as Marcel, independent of one another by a friend in Amsterdam when Italy was under siege. He's Italian. And he asked both of us, independent of each other, we didn't know this, if we could help Italy and uh, with, with the, the kind of the community at New Lab, which is a technology design center with about 700 engineers and entrepreneurs and frontier tech inventors. And uh, both of us, independent of each other, looked it up, thought mm, it looks difficult. But then as things started coming towards New York, I looked it up again online. I started seeing who was doing what. And I emailed Marcel and told him, hey, I'm thinking about maybe working on a ventilator. This MIT design looks kind of interesting. What do you think? And I also reached out to Charles Boyce in Long Island City. And all of us uh, really agreed, let's, let's give it a go. You've managed to make a bridge ventilator, as I understand it. So this is a yeah. ventilator that, if you're not in critical enough condition to need a standard ventilator, this machine is sort of a halfway step, but helps you breathe. How does it actually work? Well, basically, uh, most hospitals uh, have a bag, a, a BV bag. It's called, most people know them as Ambu bags. You'll see them in ambulances. If they need to pump air into a patient, they'll use this bag to pump air into a patient by hand. So if you think about what a human would do mechanically with their hands and are using our brains to kind of intuit how much air and what, how to treat the patient, we basically built a robotic device that does that, but that also measures respiratory volume, inhale and exhale. And we we've, we've built in a circuit board that has uh, sensors on it that can measure airflow. And so we've built a, essentially a robotic device that uh, does a lot of what a ventilator does. But really, if you think about the higher end ventilators being used at the very beginning of someone in critical care and at the very end to wean them off for all those other people in the middle that are just trying to stabilize them, this could serve that middle layer, which is a pretty big number. Now you got these into New York City hospitals last week. How many do you have out there in operation? I don't know, we're delivering, we basically sold them to New York City. And so we're delivering to the EDC and then they're working with all the public and private hospitals to place them in the hospitals. And so that's, that's their own process. We are, I know we trained about 24 physicians at Metropolitan Hospital, our, our, our principal clinician who's been advising us since the very beginning of this process, uh, has been doing trainings in hospital. I know that Bellevue has, reached, has, has received some and that Montfiore, I believe, is receiving some this week. Now, you've managed to cut down on cost, cut down on supply chain issues, and so you can make one of these for, as I understand it, like $3,300, whereas a standard ventilator is more like $30,000. And you've also got companies like Honeywell helping you supply some of the parts quickly. Um, you know, talk to us about the, the, the process of actually putting the pieces together in a short amount of time. Yeah, I mean, with a lot of factories being closed down around the world, uh, probably, you know, I, I'd ask my team every single day during the heat of the moment when we were really at an intense inflection point when the hospitals were under the gun, the doctors and, and the head of, head of uh, hospital health services saying, we may need these tomorrow. I was just looking for points of failure. And one of the points of failure uh, really is in the supply chain. There were critical, like our motors were gonna take too long from Asia to get built because factories were closed, but we found a factory in Rochester, New York, and they mobilized people in Rochester, New York to build motors for us. And with Honeywell, uh, their entire supply chain for these sensors was pretty much frozen. Uh, there were a lot of people like you know, the Fords and the GEs ordering a lot of the sensors for what was gonna come later. We wanted to be responsive now, and so we leveraged our network, our senators, uh, CEOs of Honeywell in Asia and Europe, to call the global CEO uh, on a particular day. And I think he woke up to a flurry of emails saying, uh, New York needs your help. And, and they mobilized for us, it was pretty awesome. 